Cool. All right, so we don't have any recording, but we're getting all that. Yeah. So we go through SM1 or E1. We can do both of those at the same time, right? Because they're both going to go through the same intermediate. Um, what's the first step in our first order reactions? Leaving group leaves. So both of them are going to head twice. It's always worth a try. You never know. I'll take it. So in both cases, we wind up for the, the E1 or the SN1 with our carbocation intermediate. And what's the wrinkle, the new wrinkle we get if we make the intermediate? What do we have to watch out for? Rearrangements. So easy to miss in the time situation. I know a few people um, miss the rearrangement, but we do have a hydrogen back here. So an ethyl group won't move over. An ethyl group's too big. A methyl group can move over if this was a dimethyl where we didn't have an adjacent hydrogen, but we did have two adjacent methyls. One of the methyls could move over, like we talked about before. An ethyl group really won't do that. Occasionally, you'll see something a little bit stranger, like a um, um, it'll change the size of the cyclo group. You could wind up with, a, with the ring kind of moving over to make it from cyclopentyl to cyclohexyl. Um, because then you're not really moving all the whole thing. You're just kind of like, oh, it's already mostly in the ring structure going from a pentagon to a hexagon. It's not that big of a stretch. But the two that we always want to watch for um, are the hydrogen moving over first um, and then a methyl group if there's no hydrogen. And again, that will only happen if what? What makes it so that we see those rearrangements? Substitution. Somebody like degree of it? yes, the degree of substitution. Good. So basically, we can make a more stable carbocation. So moving over a hydrogen would allow a tertiary carbon to be charged, as opposed to a secondary carbon. And tertiary carbocations are much more stable than secondary. So that's that's the driving force behind this. The rearrangement doesn't just happen willy nilly just because which is why we don't care about the hydrogens that are down here. We could move a hydrogen from down here, but then we still have a secondary carbocation. So both of these, and again, for this problem, you didn't need to specify um, the mechanism. It just said draw the products, but for the sake of getting all the products, our actual intermediate that we wind up working with is this molecule. Not that far. And then what's our nucleophile in this case? It's a ethoxy group. And ethyl with an oxygen, right? Yeah, yeah. So if it goes SN1, our ethoxy group is going to come in and attach here. We're going to get an ethyl group and an oxygen and then an ethyl group attached to the same carbon. We need to worry about stereochemistry? No. We wind up with two identical substituents. Both directions around the ring are identical. So no, so no worrying about um, R plus S. Um, and just a recap, once we get to, even if we could tell if we had four different substituents here, we would get a 50-50 mixture of R and S because what's the geometry of a carbocation? A trigonal planar, right? It's SP2. So we would lose all stereochemistry at that point because it becomes totally flat. So our nucleophile can come in from either direction. And if it goes E1, instead of nucleophile coming in, we wind up stealing electrons from one of the sets of hydrogens next door, right? If we had these electrons move over and we just have 
we just need a base that can take that hydrogen. So we wind up with this product or just one other elimination product we could get here, which would have, what would it be? Yeah, double bond going out towards the ethyl group. Is one of those going to be favored by Sterix or Zate Sedzerol? And the, who remembers what Zate Sedzerol was? Substitution. The more substituted carbon is favored, or yeah, it's favored. Unless we had the big bulky group, right? Then we got the Hoffman product instead. Usually, we want the more substituted. Both of these are try substituted three out of the four um, spots are substituted so they both have the same substitution um, again wasn't looking for this on the test but if we looked at these two compounds in terms of their stability does one stick out as being seeming like it might be more stable than the other if there were more double bonds then we would think about resonance. Does one of these allow more resonance structures that allows the double bond to be conjugated? So for instance, if we had a double bond there, that would be more stable than, I guess that in both of those cases, it's conjugated. So that wouldn't really make a difference in this case. But yes, if there were more either lone pairs or high bonds, we would look at that. Um, more what I was, looking at, oh no, you know what? This one's here would be there, would be the double one. In, in this case, that one side would be more favored, right? Because that allows them to be conjugated. I rotated it so that I had room to draw my ethyl group and mix that up. So the double one of this pentagon would be on the opposite end. Um, so good thing to be thinking about, but in this case, not. It worked. And it's kind of, it's not quite the same category as sterics, but it's similar in terms of, is there anything that's going to throw off the bond angles? So remember these sp2 carbons want to have bond angles of 120 degrees, right? Um, what, in a regular pentagon, what's the, um, everybody know what the angles are? Regular hexagons, 120. Um, so a pentagon would be less than that, right? So putting a double bond here forces these to be a little bit closer together than they would normally be because you're stuck at less than, oh, I think it's 108 degrees. If I remember it right from the geometries. So this is forced to be 108 degrees because it's the pentagon. We do have some ring strain that we added. We didn't really have much ring strain here because 108 degrees is pretty close to 109 degrees, right? And those tetrahedral carbons all want to be about 190 degrees. But when we make two of those carbons trigonal planar, we have a little bit of ring strain versus, so this one I would expect to be a little bit more favored just based on that. Because here we have one carbon where everything's, where the ring is forced to be 120. Um, and here it's two out of five carbons. So this would be a little bit more strained, I would expect. So one of the areas like expanding the angle is that mean it's like pushing the other one right you still only have three yeah you know, whatever the the rule is in geometry when it comes to figuring out how many angles you have or uh, how many degrees you have um we still are fixed with that total number of degrees of freedom or uh, angles um so having two of the five stressed is going to be a little bit worse than having one of the five stressed. The, uh, the cyclo pencil have like a form of like a 3D shape or is it? It does. It's four of the five. And when it's cyclopentane, when they're all SP3, four of the five are planar, more or less. And then the fifth one is, they call it puckered out. So it's basically, we're looking at add two of the carbons. 
have if we had these four flat and then have one kind of up and back. So if you picture that looking at this, these four are in the plane and then the last one is kind of tilted up a little bit into the board. Um, and so that's the other thing is we're forcing everything to kind of be at least four of these are still going to be planar, but it, there's a lot more wiggle room. Literally, there's more freedom for these carbons to kind of find a better geometry um, when we don't have the double bonds part. There. Again, not something that I asked about on the test, but just so you know, get us thinking back in terms of, of OCHEM variables. So those are both of our first order reactions where we go through the carbocana and intermediate. What do we get if we go the concerted mechanisms? So first off, SN2 is a simpler one usually, right? Substitutions has fewer things going on than elimination reactions usually. So instead of making a positive charge, migrating it, and then attacking the positive charge, it's concerted. We just have our nucleophile that comes in and attaches directly to the partial positive and forces the chloride to leave at the same time. So remember our, our mechanisms, we always show the electrons moving. Since it's a positive charge, you can't really do anything since it's simply a lack of electrons. And then to make room, we have the chlorine leaving. And it's always going to be, it's the concerted mechanism. It has to come from the opposite side as the leaving group. Right? Because a partial negative is going to repel a negative here, just purely based on the sterics. Where is their room? It's opposite of the big bulky leaving group. So we wind up with the cis product. And only one. SN2 is nice that way. Almost always we'll only get one product. Sorry, I said SN1, I meant SN2, second order concerted reaction. And if we're talking about our elimination, then our nucleophile is not acting as nucleophile anymore. What does it do? Uh, takes away a proton, which means it's acting as base. So we just look at both sides in both of the alpha carbons and look at where are their hydrogens on alpha carbons. So it's still going to be the leaving group leaves. Now it's just going to be a matter of so first off, which of these hydrogens on the um, is it going to attack? Is the base going to pull off? Yet we, if this is all happening at once, we need these things to be close to planar, right? And the ring structure actually makes that kind of difficult here because we don't have total freedom for it to rotate. And so this actually probably wouldn't be a very fast elimination reaction because it's hard to get this hydrogen and that chlorine and these two carbons between all in the same plane because they're kind of all stuck in this tetrahedral shape. They're not able to just twist freely. But it does need to be 
co co periplanar. Everything has to be close to the same plane, and we want the anti attack. I don't think it meant it winds up mattering for this particular example because we don't have we have we're restricted with our rotation anyway. Um, so our first elimination product is going to be this molecule that we have the remaining hydrogen here and the hydrogen that's down into the board are both going to flatten out, wind up with this product. Then we need to check if there's, there's not really a good target on this side. Normally we're just looking for alpha hydrogens, but our alpha hydrogen on this carbon um, is in the same plane. So it would have to attack from the sin angle on the same side as the chlorine, which can happen, but it's going to be a pretty tiny amount. Um, but I was, for the sake of this question, um, I don't think I got that in depth when I was grading them. I was looking for both of those products, um, for both this product and then the other one's going to be this product. And we expect to see a whole lot less of this, even though that's the same set product, it's more substituted, but you have to get there by pulling a hydrogen off um, from the sin direction rather than anti. So in both of these cases, eight sets rule doesn't wind up being the dominant force when it comes to figuring out what's what, but again, not, not what this question was about on the, on the test. All right. So now that we've kind of got our OCHEM brains back, that one was really the tricky one out of the two. On the final, Um, we didn't have this B, didn't have any rearrangements. So, and um, so I don't think this one was as tricky. So I'm going to leave that one for now. When I hand them back, and I'll give you a few minutes to look at it, if anything, if you were marked down for something that you don't understand why on that one, we can go back through it. Uh, for picking the mechanisms, I gave you the section on the left here, but I didn't give you this one. So it's just a matter of remembering, okay, strong base, weak nucleophile is always E2. Uh, weak base, weak nucleophile really it's the only way you're going to get your first order reactions consistently. Um, and it's mostly just with the tertiary ones. Realistically, you're going to get some um, E1 and SN1 if it's secondary, but it's going to be mostly for the tertiary carbons. Um, and then our, if it's strong base and strong nucleophile, still going to be inserted. It's just going to depend on whether or not it's where your leaving group is, the primary, secondary, tertiary. Is this all? I don't know. I don't know about about everybody else, but I felt like because I've had barely any break, I feel like I'm still right in the thick of this. Um, but I know it's been a long time for everybody else. How did drawing the NMR spectra go? I think everybody did pretty well on that one.
Um, and I gave you the relative shifts in the table, right? So you had roughly where, and I wasn't looking for it to be perfect. Um, you know, how many signals would we have for this molecule? If you count all the aromatic hydrogens as one. So we have protons here. So we get a signal here that's different than that signal. No protons there. No protons there or there. So if we're calling all of our aromatic protons as one signal. Because they're opposite of each other, they're carbon one and carbon four, it would probably be a, look more like two signals, but not really getting that picky about it. For this one, they're all going to be in the aromatic region away from everything else. So one, two, three, four, five. So, and then it's just kind of the peak splitting, we can kind of, the way that I would approach these is once I know the right number of signals, I go through and I would label each of the group of signals, a, B, C, D, E. And then I put them in an approximate chemical shift. Like, okay, just to get them in the right order. It's going to go in the most be shielded here. It's going to be the aromatics between, between six and eight, right? And then probably this one's probably going to be the most be shielded um, after that. Because it's directly attached to an oxygen, oxygen's more electronegative than chlorine, and carbon's in the middle. That's not really in the middle of a carbon chain, but it's the middle of the molecule, and to be a little bit more shielded or deshielded than methyl groups at the end of the carbon chain, and to be um, closer to zero. So probably the most shielded is going to be that methyl, and then. That CH2 group there. Then this CH2 group, then that CH2 group would be my guess. And we go back and look at the table to actually iron that out. Um, it's just a matter of you know, using those tables takes a little bit to know what you're looking at, but once you know what you're looking at, they're really powerful, right? They're kind of easy to use once you get the hang of what it's telling you. Um, and then Relative appropriate peak splitting. Remember, we're using that n plus one rule, right? Nearest neighbors plus one. So, nearest neighbors for this carbon, for carbon A, it's got two nearest neighbors, so we would see a triplet. And the integration would be three, right? So, three carbon or three hydrogens with two nearest neighbors. So, Starting from zeros over here, our most shielded is going to be a triplet with an integration of three. I wasn't picky about how big you drew your integration line. Just show me this, like that integral symbol with the number next to it was all I was looking for. This card has got four nearest neighbors. And it's going to have an integration of two. Then it's probably this one, two nearest neighbors, integration of two. Two nearest neighbors means it'll be a triplet with an integration of two. Also a triplet, integration of two. But directly attached to an oxygen, that's probably more de shielded further away from zero, further to the left. And then our aromatic group here. Um, it is going to look more or less like, again, I wasn't looking for it to be too specific in this case, but because it's carbon one and carbon four, um, and there's a different amount of electronegativity on the up on this carbon here, the one directly attached to the oxygen, we're going to wind up with a doublet of doublets in the aromatic region. Um, so fairly spread out. And this is one of those ones where 
because it's a doublet of doublet, you wind up with a smaller peak, a bigger peak, big gap, bigger peak, smaller peak. So it kind of looks like a more spread out quartet a little bit as far as the size of the peaks. Um, and that's that comes from that interaction of coupling between them. Um, and the, I would just be looking for the entire integral for this entire thing would be an integral. What causes the aromatic uh, like higher sugars to be more de-shielded? Like oxidation. So it's mostly due to the fact that these pi bonds aren't stuck really between the two carbons. So aromatic, I believe, are even more de-shielded than just regular regular alkenes. Because for a regular alkene, you wind up with If, we, if you think about what the shape of the, the um, pi bond is, for if it's a regular alkene, we've got you know, our sigma bond looks like this. And then our pi bond is, is above and below. And then so any hydrogens attached here would be sticking into the board and out of the board. But the thing about the the aromatics is that those pi bonds aren't really staying in between any two of the carbons, right? They're being shared like that donut of pi bond, which means they're actually more in the middle of the ring. They're slightly, their ports pulled slightly over the top of the ring instead of directly over the top of the carbons. So they're kind of in the middle. Um, and so that means that their, their, electro, their electron density is pulled away from whatever's attached to the outside a little bit more. So if that's a hydrogen, it's a little bit more de-shielded. Um, and it winds up actually being, you know, when we talk about why hydrogen bonds um, between in intermolecular forces, if you think back to, to Gen Chem, in our intermolecular forces, we said, oh, if you have a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen or a nitrogen, it pulls all of the hydrogen's electron density and you get almost a full partial positive charge on the hydrogen. That's also talking about shielding, right? Um, aromatics are about as de-shielded as a hydrogen that's directly attached to an oxygen or a nitrogen um, because all of the, that, those resonance structures pull the electron density inward. Yeah, it's, it's fun at this point that now we know enough about chemistry that we don't really have to make nearly as many approximations and generalizations. We can kind of explain a lot of those um, irregularities. So then you get something that looks more like a multiplet that's just kind of a mess. The integration would still be four, but it wouldn't be a doublet of doublets. Yeah, that's usually the most organized way. That, or if you have two of the same substituents, because then you can have more symmetry, right? You can, if you can picture, um, a molecule where what is your spore is attached. With dichlorobenzene, if it's one or dichlorobenzene, then yeah, we're going to get our doublet of doublets. If you put one of the chlorines up here, though, then you're going to have that carbon is different than these carbons, which is different than that carbon. So now you have three distinct carbons instead of only two distinct carbons. And so we still are, now we have three signals all in the same spaces as each other. And so it starts getting a lot more sloppy. Um, you could still wind up, if you had this though, now we only have two distinct hydrogens again, right? Because those are identical and that's identical. And so that's another one where you might see a doublet of doublets. But as soon as one of these is different than the other, now all of a sudden, now it's four distinct hydrogens. And now it's a now it's a multiplet again. Now it's a big mess. So, 
But even if they're different, if it's one four, if it's one four, you can only possibly have two distinct hydrogens because these two are always going to be the same. These two are always going to be the same. If it's one four, actually, in this case, they're all identical. So you wouldn't even get a double of doublets. You would just get one signal. So that's why when it comes to the aromatics, the chemical shift telling you that you have a benzene ring is really critical. And um, and we can look at the splitting a little bit, but the integration is going to be really critical too. So it's going to be, you know, if it's a benzene ring, it's got somewhere between one, one and five hydrogens. It's a, if it's only substituted in one spot, you could have an integral of four, of uh, five there. So seeing those integrals of that whole region um, is, is really reliable. Versus in the splitting, it can tell you where it's substituted, but sometimes it gets too much to be able to interpret much wrong. At this point, I'm sure that there are people that are better at reading NMR that, that literally do this for a living. They would be like, oh, no, you can tell if it's a 1-3 substitution by looking for these characteristics, um, but we're not there yet. It is. It's I. I was always. I always liked IR better because we learned it first and it's simpler. Um, and I. I would always just stare at my lab instructor when he'd say things like, "Oh, the NMR has all the information. You don't need anything more than the NMR." I just got lost <laughs> until I started understanding how it worked a little bit better. Uh, and speaking of. Are these the same? I think these are the same ones that we did. I didn't re-grab these figures. So I think this is yeah, the same final as 2022, 2021. Um, and I think those were the same choices you had here. So well, what's the first thing we look for? We had an NMR and an IR, and we've got a range of possible compounds. Yeah, look for the easy stuff in the IR which the obvious one is usually an OH group, which we definitely have here. Um, and then the next most obvious one is usually if, if there's a carbonyl, none of our choices had carbonyls, so it didn't really matter in this case. Um, but if we didn't have those choices, we could still look, okay, between you know, 1700 to 1800 and 16 to 18, is there a big, strong, well-defined peak? Not really. So no carbonyl, definitely an OH group. I put the line 3000 for you. Be nice in terms of being able to, you didn't have to estimate. Um, we definitely have P on the left side and the right side. So we need SP2 carbon hydrogens and SP3 carbon hydrogens. So that means if the OH didn't already eliminate our dichloral, the fact that we have SP2 and SP3 does. But all the rest of them, it does also allow us to toss this one, right? This molecule doesn't have any SP3 carbon hydrogens. So without even knowing the formula, we can toss this one as well. So then that means for the NMR, all we really need to do is be able to differentiate between these. And the fact that we have aromatics and alcohol and just a methyl group versus aromatics and alcohol and two carbons should be enough. So we would look, be looking for at the number of signals besides the aromatic and besides the OH. So this is ROH. And remember, we can't trust splitting when it comes to OHs. But either way, we don't have any near standards, so we wouldn't expect to see any, any splitting. So beyond our OH and our aromatic, we have two other signals, which that right there is all we need to be able to pick this one. Just like when you're learning how to do arithmetic, it's helpful to check your work. Um, it is, you should still be able, if you're 99.9% .9 certain this is the case, you should still be able to say, okay, then my integration, my peak splitting should also match up with that as well. So if you have the time, just give it a, 
equate one silver. I mean, yeah, that looks like a two to three ratio. And that, you know, the resolution is not great on a, on a test. That looks like a quartet and it looks like a triplet, which means our peak splitting works for an ethyl CH2 adjacent to a CH3. Um, I think everybody did, I think everybody got that full credit on that one because I think this is one of the areas we feel pretty strong at collectively. I like this one. <laughs> Good, because we're going to do more of that. Our first lab today is going to we're going to introduce a new type of spectra um, called uh, mass spectrometry, which is pretty similar. If you've ever had your hands swabbed at the airport, where they they take the swab and they stick it in the in a machine, then it tells you if you're carrying dynamite or anything like that. And they do secondary screening. They that's what the the standard security procedure is on airplanes now. If you get slipped for secondary screening, they just they take a little cloth and they wipe down your hands and the inside of your baryon, um, which can cause, it's helpful to know how that works. We talk, it's basically a very crude, very low precision version of mass spec. The chemistry grade mass specs are a lot, we can get a lot more information, um, but those, those are, they basically just look at how it breaks down. It's kind of like comparing the fingerprint region to a database. It has a list of if these things show up in the spectrum, flag it, um, which means they can test for a whole bunch of things um, when they do that. Um, my personal, not my personal, it's my dad's story, but he um, he works on insurance claims, or he used to, and he had to go out to a, um, a mine in Colorado where they do a lot of blasting um, to do an inspection for something. And then he had to go and get on an airplane afterwards and they and got selected for secondary screening and they swabbed his hands. Like, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm sorry, but that's gonna go off because I have dynamite residue all over me. I was at a blast site today. Um, and sure enough, it, it binged and they had to like take everything out of his suitcase, take off of his shoes and go, you know, check everything. Um, but uh, it's helpful to know how those work so that you know when stuff's gonna get flagged. So you can kind of like, hey, just so you know, this shouldn't come as a surprise. I'm not sketchy though, I promise. Yes. <laughs> um, how do we feel about nomenclature? Worth going through some review? We feel pretty good about it. Maybe one of the ones with um, parentheses, just for the sake of reminding ourselves how that works. Let's see. This one's definitely going to need some parentheses. We'll do that. So our longest continuous carbon chain looks to be Surprisingly hard to draw on a trackpad with one finger while you're clicking with the other finger. That looks like our longest continuous carbon chain. Which is gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So our parent molecule is decane. Then we've got two identical branches. I guess we could avoid, you know, we can avoid one of the sets of parentheses if we if we circle the one, two up here instead. Then we'd have three, that's a more interesting name. Let's do that. So it's still gonna be decane. Now we've got, and just eyeballing it without even doing any counting, a lot more of our branches are on this side than on that side. So we'll start counting from the carbon from the top right. 
So it's going to be we've got two methyl groups. And again, not worried about the, the alphabetization. So um, just going to pick. I usually we just start count from carbon one, but so whatever the first branch you run into is, and write that one first. So two, two four dimethyl. Three ethyl six, and then we have a complicated branch, so it's an ethyl group with a methyl group attached. So there's our two carbons, ethyl group that has a methyl group attached to it. So that's a, in parentheses, a methyl ethyl. Two, four, dimethyl, three, ethyl, six, methyl, ethyl, decade. Mouthful, but like I kept harping on last quarter, once we get those rules down, they never change. So get them down to the point where you can't possibly forget them. And the only thing that there is to add to that is other new functional groups. Um, there's the clock. So we'll take our break after this one. The other two wrinkles are the stereochemistry, right? Do we need to worry about R and S and do we need to worry about E and Z or cis and trans? So something like this, you know, cis versus trans, but I think we're all pretty comfortable with, with the way we would name that. Um, this one, these ones are interesting though, because do we wind up with do we need to say R R versus S for each of those? We have two stereo centers there down in the internal mirror plane. So just saying cis is not quite enough. We would need to go through and assign the priority. So for the top carbon, one, two, three, and the hydrogen is four going into the board already. One, two, three. Top carbon is going to be R. The bottom carbon is also going to be R. Because you want to have one, two, three, but the height is pointing towards us, so we're looking at the other side. So it'd be one R, two R, trans dimethyl cyclohexane. And same priority system for E and Z for the only documents, right? E is our E is intgegen for against, which means the same thing as trans, versus Z is zusamanin, zusamen, which we have German speakers in here. Okay. My other the class at STHS actually has has a kid who speaks German pretty well, who corrects my German when I mispronounce things. Um, on the easy words, which I do appreciate actually, but I won't look at look for you guys to correct my German pronunciation if nobody's taken German. All right. Next stuff that we'll get into, we haven't really talked about synthesis yet, kind of put that off. Um, so we'll leave that for now. Let's take our break. Let's come back at 10 after. And we'll get into some new mechanisms. Oh, and that is. Also, I do have a key up here that's fairly comprehensive if you want it. 
to check anything you missed. Do you have questions? Otherwise, we'll resume at 10 after.
All right. Rooms are so new that people still hadn't peeled the protective coating off the off of the screen over here. I love that feeling. All right. So our first. Our first new reaction that we're going to talk about. Yes, first off, any questions on the test? And we went through the trickiest ones, I think. Um, and like all my tests, I try not to surprise you with things you haven't seen before. So I think I got a lot of clarification that everybody needed before, before you took the test. All right, so first thing we're going to add and uh, talking in terms of, it's nice that Teams now detects when you're giving slide slideshow and automatically hides the message because you don't even see my, my I am chat with my wife during the day. Don't need that on the recording. So um, in terms of the, uh, the chapter numbers, I believe we actually we skipped over alkenes and alkynes. We've talked a lot about their properties. We didn't really do anything when it came to their reactions because we wanted to go through the substitution and elimination reactions first. So in terms of chapter numbers, we're going back through now. I think this was now like six and seven and eight were alkenes and alkyne reactions. Um, so the basic 
most common alkene reactions um, are pretty much almost all of the alkene reactions we're going to look at are going to involve breaking the double bond because pi bonds are inherently not as stable as sigma bonds. Um, because frankly, you just don't get as much overlap between the orbitals for a pi bond, right? Because you have to use those unhybridized p orbitals. They're not directly pointed at each other. Um, so sigma bonds in general are more stable. So most of the reactions of pi bonds are reactions that result in breaking the pi bonds and making new sigma bonds instead. So this first one is actually just the the, I don't know if you call it the opposite or the inverse um, of our elimination reactions. So instead of an elimination reaction where we start with a good leaving group and then we make a pi bond, addition reactions, we break the pi bond and we add something to each side so that each carbon still has four bonds. Uh, the second question will make more sense when we talk about the mechanism. Um, how would we expect, even if you didn't know what this, this reaction was going to make, is there anything that we, any parts of either of these molecules that we would expect might be attracted to each other? What's the general gist of our mechanisms overall? What are we doing? We're tracking electron movement and electronegativity, right? So what part of either of these molecules are going to be attracted to each other? Pi bonds are going to be attracted to something. Pi bonds are just electrons, right? And rather unstable electrons at that. So even if there's not a partial negative charge on them, there's still a, a lot of electron density that's kind of unstable. So our pi bond is going to be attracted to which part of the HBR? Probably the hydrogen, right? We wouldn't expect, so it's not in it. The electrons are attracted to not a nucleophile. The electrons are the nucleophile. So they're attracted to, what's the opposite of a nucleophile? Does everybody remember the term? Electrophile, yep. So the hydrogen is the electrophile in this case. So the first thing that happens is, and it, it works, there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different mechanisms, but it's in general going to be, okay, your pi bond is attracted to something with a partial positive, or at least something with an empty spot in its, in its uh, valence shell. And then in this case, we also have a bleeding group leaves reaction happening at the same time. Uh, do you remember what our four basic categories of mechanisms were? There are four steps. Substitution, nucleophilic attack, nucleophilic attack, leaving group leaves, rearrangements, and what was it? Proton. And proton transfer. So this is mostly, we think about this as the proton transfer. It's not as obvious because it's not it's a, a lone pair grabbing a hydrogen like we saw for most of our proton transfers, but it's still a pair of electrons grabbing hydrogen and then something leaves. So we have an, an acid and a base. It's just not what our acids and bases usually look like. So in that case, we wind up with a new carbon hydrogen bond right here. And then now we've got a carbon that was, it's still sp2, it was part of the pi bond, but now it's missing electrons because the pi bond electrons are now over here in the sigma bond. So we get a carbocation intermediate again. That's kind of nice. We know how stability rules work for carbocations at this point. So that's going to that's gonna be helpful. And then once we have something with a negative charge and a carbocation, now we get a nucleophilic attack. The bromide just comes in and makes our new bond. So it's it really is kind of the exact opposite of the elimination reaction, right? The elimination reaction, we'd be starting here, and the first step would be leaving group leaves, which leaves a carbocation intermediate. And then you have something coming around, taking the hydrogen, 
so that you can make a pi bond. This is the exact same steps in reverse. So easy enough in terms of a mechanism, the biggest wrinkles are going to be, okay, well, how do we know where our, our new substituents are going? We have two different substituents here, right? Almost always it's going to be, you're gonna add one half of your, of your new molecule, it's gonna get added to one of the carbons, and the other half gets added to the other carbon. Um, but how do we know which one goes where? Well, it's going to follow our rules of car carbocation stability, right? If we're going to make, if the first step is the proton transfer, we're going to make our new carbon-hydrogen bonds has to be on the carbon that gives you the more substituted carbocation, right? Which in this case, they're identical, so it didn't really make a difference. We did make something with a stereo center, though. And we have an asymmetric carbon right here, right? So based on this mechanism, would we expect to see one stereoisomer, just R or just S, or the mixture of both, or semic mixture? Yeah, our carbocation intermediate is flat, right? If our carbocation intermediate is flat, it's sp2 because it's got that unhybridized empty section of the p orbital. That means our bromide can come in and attach from top or from the bottom, which means even if we don't draw it with stereochemistry, we're going to get a mixture of the R and the S if we make a, a um, um, an asymmetric carbon in the process here. So just like with substitution or elimination, when you go through that carbocation intermediate, you lose the stereochemistry. In this case, we never gain the stereochemistry. We started with something flat and we made something that's going to be a mixture of RNS. So if the carbocation stability is going to govern where we put the positive charge, then that means it's also going to control which possible product, right? So this this example here, where we have uh, two methyl or methyl propene, when that goes through an addition reaction. And the name, the addition reactions can have some different mechanisms. And in general, we name them according to just what's being added to each side. So this is a hydrobromination addition because we're adding a hydrogen to one side and bromine to the other side. Um, it'll be important for making that distinction later on when we have just bromination, which adds a bromine to both sides or hydrogenation, which adds a hydrogen to both sides. So a hydrobromination going through that, that uh, carbocation intermediate. It can be helpful also to just go through the possible draw of possible intermediates. Because if you're making a carbocation intermediate, the positive charge has to be on one of the two carbons that's part of the pi bond, right? So for this molecule, our carb two possible carbocation intermediates. So here, if we added our hydrogen to carbon one, we get a tertiary carbocation. We added our hydrogen to carbon two, we get a primary carbocation. And we know that that won't happen, right? Um, and this, I had the ability to draw on the screen here. Well, we can draw out the same mechanism. So it'll look identical to what we had on the previous page, it's just propene instead of um, butane now, or butene. Pi bond grabs hydrogen, bromine keeps its electrons, makes an intermediate with a positive charge 
here's our the and in this case we're only going to see this product so we have the uh, intermediate product which of the ones at the bottom just as a recap which of those structures is going to be the most stable out of these three possibilities tertiary carbocation more stable and secondary in the middle more stable than primary right, and this is some a familiar slide if you wouldn't have remembered this term, but this is how we explain why that is the case, right? Um, that hyperconjugation, when you have a bunch of sp3 carbon adjacent to a carbocation, remember our carbocation, it's an sp2 carbon because that last lobe of the p orbital just stays unhybridized, so it stays shaped like a p orbital. If you have an empty p orbital next to carbon hydrogen pi bar or sigma bonds, it can make almost this sort of pseudo pi bond. It donates a little electron density to the empty p orbital. And again, this is the same mechanism by which our rearrangements happen, right? A sigma bond adjacent to a carbocation makes this pseudo pi bond, if bringing the whole hydrogen over would give us a more substituted carbocation then it just sort of, it continues to smear out and it drags the hydrogen with it until we get our sigma bond over here. So let's practice. What is the preferred product when we do a hydrobromination with each of these alkenes? Right. And so to answer this question on a test, you wouldn't, again, this is a case where you don't need to show the mechanism, it just says what's the product. So for full credit, you don't need to show the intermediate. It can be helpful though, especially given that this is a, a carbocation cation intermediate that can go through a rearrangement, drawing the intermediate can be helpful in terms of making sure you don't have a rearrangement happening. So for the cyclohexyl, molecule, our intermediate, it's going to look like this, right? Our new carbon hydrogen bond is to the primary carbon, which gives us our carbocation on a tertiary carbon. So our product is going to look like this.
for the second molecule, our new carbon hydrogen bond is going to go on the primary carbon again, which puts a positive charge on the secondary carbon, which means our major product is going to be putting the bromine on that secondary carbon. This is also an interesting one. It's worth reminding ourselves how resonance works because this is one where we'll get a mixture, a measurable mixture of products because we have a significant resonance structure, right? The resonance structure for our intermediate looks like looks like this with a positive, and that does put a positive charge on a primary carbon, but because it's resonance stabilized, that will be a significant resonance structure. It's not as stable as putting the positive charge on a secondary carbon, but it's going to be present enough that we would have a measurable minor product that's going to look like this, with the pi bond in the middle, the bromine on carbon one. But what you won't see is you won't see any product that puts the bromine on a primary carbon and leaves the pi bond between the opposite, between carbons three and four. Right, so if we added our, our hydrogen here with the positive charge here, now we can't have any resonance, right? And it's a part of positive charge on a primary carbon. This intermediate will never happen within sig figs. Right, it's such a small fraction that goes there. We basically say that doesn't happen. So we would have no measurable amount of that product. But we will have a measurable amount of the product with the pi bond between two and three and the bromine on the end. But this is still what we expect more of. Not a whole lot that's any different about the third example or the fourth example. We already did the fourth example, it's our first reaction. For the cycle of pencil, our intermediate's gonna look like this. No rearrangement to worry about because it's already on a tertiary carbon. So our product is going to look just, just like the top product, except with a five-sided ring instead of a six-sided ring. Right, and so this is just like there was Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule was the one that said when you do elimination reactions, you preferentially form the alkene that's more substituted. We have a similar rule um, called Markovnikov's rule. And I think I probably brought up that Zaitsev had internal feud with, with uh, an older grad student in his research group. That was Markovnikov. Um, so Markovnikov published um, his he was supposed to do, a, he was studying addition reactions, and he published his first paper in what was supposed to be a series of three papers. Um, and Zaitsev waited until after he had published before he revealed he had already done research that disproved um, some of Markovnikov's work that he had just published. So instead of telling him internally so he could fix it before it went to publication, he waited so that Markovnikov had to print a retraction um, because because chemists can be petty too. <laughs> and it was all because Markovnikov badmouthed him, badmouthed Zaitsev at his thesis defense. Um, Markovnikov was talking shit about Zaitsev after he left the room, trying to say that Zaitsev didn't deserve a PhD for the work he had done. 
Um, and then they still had to work together after that, which led to this you know, ongoing back and forth. Yeah, so Markov Nikov's rule is the one, it, the formulation, see if I have the official wording on the next slide or not. Um, I don't have the official wording, but basically it means that you're gonna add your, your new substituent, your non-hydrogen substituent is going to be added to the more substituted carbon. I have to be careful how I phrase that because we still use the term Markovnikov's rule, even when it's not acid catalyzed, when it's not a proton transfer to the first step. Um, but they, in general, we don't consider a hydrogen to be a substituent on a carbon. So usually the way we phrase it is our new substituent being bromine, being chloride, being, you're gonna see OHs, OH groups in the next one, um, are always going to get added to the more substituted carbon with a few exceptions. But those are, the Markovnikov's rule is enough of a set in stone rule that we specifically call out mechanisms as being anti-Markovnikov. We can make the anti-Markovnikov product a few ways, um, but Markovnikov's rule is enough of a good general rule that that's should always be your first thought. If you're adding something, the non-hydrogen substituent goes on the more substituted carbon. What changes about it if we're using HCl instead of HBr? The size of the anion is different. I just meant as far as the products. Does anything really change about the products? You get a CL instead of a BR, but it's still in the same spot. Right? So that has its own name, that's hydrobromination and hydrofluorination and hydroiodination and hydrofluorination, but they're all the same mechanism. The only thing that's different is where do you put or what is the halogen that you have when you break that by bond. HCl and HBr do. Chloride and bromides are pretty similar. Iodine is a little trickier to work with, um, but it's an even better leaving group. So in industrial chemistry, um, you see iodine used a lot. In lab scale chemistry, we use bromine a lot, so it's easier to work with than iodine. Um, especially hydrohydric acid is a lot nastier than hydrobromic acid. Um, but that's actually, uh, it's just the, it's very similar to one of the steps um, that's used in making a lot of illicit drugs. Um, and so that's actually why iodine being such a good leaving group is why iodine is, so, is pretty tightly regulated um, by the DEA because it's really, pivotal in in um, some of the some of the steps when you're making meth or MDMA um, any amphetamines but those especially are the ones that are most trapped um, so actually so when we order new I2 just straight iodine as a solid it's like a six month process for us because we have to go through a DEA screening kind of every time because they track when was the last time you ordered iodine and for the size of your school, are you using it too fast? Is somebody stealing the iodine? Um, but because the iodine that you buy in a bottle at the store is not I2. It's actually a different compound um, entirely. So just a note about the halides in general. Iodine in synthetic purposes tends to be ideal because it's such a good leaving group. Um, but in everyday use in the labs, we tend to stick with bromine, which is not trapped. It fills the same role. So it's one of those, like, it's not really very obvious. If you know your chemistry, the DEA is not tracking the right things because anybody who can't get their hands on iodine but knows their chemistry can just use bromine instead and get slightly worse yields. But then again, there's a lot of things about the war on drugs that don't make sense. So. All right, so if we switch out what our nucleophile is, what our substituent is, the general mechanism doesn't really change, like we just saw with HCl, 
So we can actually use oxygen as our nucleophile as well. Um, and so if we do that, we end up adding the walk off with the eraser again. Oh yeah, sorry. My angle blended in with the black frame. Thank you. If we look at what is being added across the pi bond, we add a hydrogen to one side of the pi bond and an OH to the other side of the pi bond. Then collectively, we've added a water molecule, right? We've added it in two pieces, but we added a water molecule. So they refer to this as a hydration reaction, even though we're not adding an entire water molecule in any one spot, we added two hydrogens and an oxygen. So the one I have drawn here, I just put a R instead of a CH3, but just so I could draw out the new bonds more explicitly. So, and anytime you have an alkene, with acid and water present, you're going to get some of this reaction. In fact, this is one of the um, one of the primary ways that that a lot of spices will lose their flavor because a lot of spices have alkene bonds in them. Like think of your lemon oil structure, right? Um, and so if you let lemon oil be exposed to water in a slightly acidic environment, and we're talking about a lemon here, um, then you can wind up breaking a lot of those alkene bonds and hydrating it, and you make a compound that's similar, but it's not going to have the same flavors, or at least not necessarily the intensive of flavor, um, which is why a lot of times, you know, there is a shelf life on a lot of things. And if it's not, if it's not hydration of an alkene, usually it's oxidation, which we'll talk about how O2 reacts with pi bonds as well. That's why it's important to not only have your spices dry, you also want to keep the lids on nice and tight. They're going to be you're storing them for an extended period of time. Or even better, just don't have the ground version because the difference in the amount of surface area, we'd spend a lot of time with our essential oil extractions, making sure we have lots of surface area, right? If we don't have very much surface area, there's not very much of your compounds exposed to oxygen to get oxidized. So, you, so whole cloves have a sh almost indefinite shelf life as long as they're not getting super hot. But ground cloves, if you buy it, has very short shelf life because that eugenol gets oxidized really quickly because you have so much more surface area. But when in doubt, buy your spices whole. The last a lot longer. Like in a restaurant, um, the chef would like have scrap or like just because they order service, but he wouldn't even use any like the day before. Yeah, and you see that a lot with um, wasabi does the same thing. And horseradish in general, freshly ground horseradish and freshly ground wasabi is so much spicier um, and has so much more flavor than the stuff that you get, you know, from the Fraley sushi counter that was made a long time ago. Although, corollary to that, the sushi the, or the wasabi paste that you can get out of the tube at the grocery store is well sealed. And it's actually very, very spicy. I was very surprised. I was expecting it to be kind of bland when I when uh, we made some sushi at home one time, and that was. Uh, yeah. I love horseradish stuff. So my my daughter won't won't eat hot sauce, but she'll eat wasabi straight. She does. She like oh, horseradish spicy is her jam. I know, that's what I like. It's like, oh, that was too much, but it'll be gone in just a second. Or it's just like bullets or something like that. Or this I'm it's just like the, the next half hour. Yeah. Of life, I'm not All right. Um, was there anything? Sorry, I skipped forward. If it's an acid catalyzed, where you, you will usually specify that these reactions are acid catalyzed, just to say that we have extra H pluses around for that first step for breaking the pi bonds. Um, other than that, it's really an identical mechanism. The only thing that's different is your nucleophile. After you break the pi bonds, your nucleophile that's going to attack the carbocation is a lone pair from an oxygen instead of a chloride or a bromide. And then you wind up with one extra proton transfer step at the end. 
to go from, so we, our first product would be a whole water molecule attached positive charge on the oxygen. So our last step would just be something can act as a base and grab that hydrogen to go one last proton transfer step. Again, nothing, nothing we haven't seen seen before as far as these mechanism steps, right? Any other wrinkles I wanted to talk about first? Trophilic so, addition. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and I guess there's the last, last thought here. It's just a reminder. If addition and elimination are the same reactions back and, backward or forward, and that means that we have to be, we can, we have to use our conditions of our reaction in order to favor one side versus the other. It's not quite, it's not necessarily an equilibrium reaction, which is why they don't just use the equilibrium arrow here. Um, but you can undo an addition reaction by going through an elimination. So there is an equilibrium component to it. Uh, if we wanted to favor addition, we want the addition to happen and we don't want the elimination reaction to happen. How would we do that? What would we do? We want to favor the enthalpy term. Enthalpy term favors addition because now we're all sigma bonds. Sigma bonds are better than pi bonds or stable. So if we want the enthalpy term to be bigger or more significant, how do we, we can't really change the enthalpy term but we can change the entropy term with this T in front of it, right? So we're going to want to do this at high temperature or low temperature. Yeah. Low temperature is going to favor the addition. High temperature is going to favor the elimination. Um, if we don't have water, but we have an alcohol instead, we kind of, it's almost a, it's a chemist, ochem student mean to name water like it's an alcohol. Um, because it basically is the simplest alcohol. It's not technically an alcohol because it doesn't have a carbon, but it's an OH group, right? It's just an OH group attached to another H. What would we get if we had an alcohol act as our nucleophile. Still going to go through the same acid catalyzed addition. We just wind up instead of having an, a water molecule attached for our second intermediate. We get an alcohol attached as our intermediate. So if I replace one of these with an R group, so this really works for any alcohol, then our proton transfer is just going to pull the this hydrogen off, and so we're going to wind up making an ether instead of making an alcohol. Instead of just adding an OH group, we added an oxygen attached to another carbon. But again, same exact mechanism. with a slightly different product. So the same way that substitution, it mattered if it was SN1 or SN2, but it didn't really matter what your nucleophile was, right? Same with these acid catalyzed additions, um, or also called electrophilic additions, because you have the, the acid acts as the electrophile to break that final.
right? So more practice for, for drawing these mechanisms, they should really all start feeling like you're doing the same thing over and over again. The only thing that's changing is what's your nucleophile. All right. We'll go ahead and stop there for today.